Good morning. I appreciate your having me here, both uh, given what we heard from John Donovan, Janesville, some of the smartest, most capable people speaking before, but also the great work that Operation Hope does. I'm going to talk today about what I call navigating the new Gilded Age, putting Operation Hope in context. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are, then I'm going to talk about how we got here, followed by why I'm an optimist about the future. So question one, what exactly is going on? We find ourselves at a time where there was an entrenched system that saw minimal innovation, and a dissatisfied public turned to a very controversial leader who offered better service with direct-to-consumer technologies, upending the establishment, shredding norms, but breaking rules, and, and there's a debate about whether laws were broken. I'm talking, of course, about Uber, <laughs> because this describes exactly how Uber has hit the marketplace. Now, that's not who you thought I was talking about. You thought I was talking about the chief executive, our disruptor in chief, President Trump. And frankly, when you think about Donald Trump, the best way to understand him may well be as a disruptor. He's got a disruptive agenda. The America first agenda in foreign policy, in trade, is a sea change from decades of US global leadership and uh, bringing multilateral, multinational organizations together. His policies on climate, his policies on the environment, are radical changes from at least the last eight years. Similarly, he has a disruptive approach. World leaders have always, you know, there was the great kitchen debate between Richard Nixon and, uh, and Brezhnev. We're now on to Twitter and nicknames, uh, which is disruptive for folks trying to understand how much risk is there on the Korean Peninsula, for example. Uh, likewise, presidents and the media don't always get along, but the war between Donald Trump and the mainstream media is unlike any prior administration's battle with the fourth estate. Very disruptive times. The president has a disruptive team. He was hired in his mind by voters looking for change who wanted things different. So most presidents bring cabinet officials who have government experience, 81, 91 percent when you take a look at the last four presidents. Donald Trump, a little more than half of his first cabinet brought government experience. President Obama didn't want anybody in his first cabinet that he perceived to be tainted with, with C-suite experience. But he liked lots of PhDs who had studied in academic settings problems. Donald Trump, exact inverse. No PhDs in his first cabinet, but almost a quarter of folks who have been CEOs. It's not just by design, it's also by operation. You know, the, the, uh, the man who was famous for the line, you're fired on Celebrity Apprentice, has had significant turnover in the first year of his uh, White House. Uh, it was double the Ronald Reagan 17% of turnover, which itself was about twice as much as average had been seen. At the cabinet level in the first 15 months, Reagan and President Clinton each saw one cabinet person either retire or shift jobs. Donald Trump's at five, uh, and I haven't looked at the paper this morning. <laughs> but it's not an accident. For anybody who thinks that this is an aberration or that we find ourselves in times caused by Donald Trump, it's not true. He is a symptom, not a cause. Americans want change. The red line shows you voters who think we're on the wrong track. The green line, right track. And you'll notice it's more than a decade and a half voters have said we're on the wrong track. And as a result, five of our last six elections have been change elections. Voters want change and they're not getting it. And it's not just here at home. Look around the world and what you'll find, whether it's uh, Brexit in the UK or even Macron in France, it's not always the populist candidate, it's the different candidate. Uh, voters around the world want something different. They're not happy with how things are going, which leads to question two. So how did we get here? How did we get to a time when voters want so much change? And I'll offer seven trends driving disruption. First, as we heard from the first speaker this morning, the pace of change technologically is accelerating. It took cars 55 years to get to one quarter of our population. It took the television 26 years. High-speed internet got to one quarter of our population in just six years. When I went to college, if you studied to be a doctor, a radiologist, you were made, you had a job, a high-paying job for the rest of your life. Yet these days, radiologists are competing against radiologists in countries such as India. Well-trained, very smart, and thanks to high-speed networks can get the MRI or the CAT scan instantly. And by the way, the radiologists in India and in the United States are all going to lose their jobs to IBM's Watson within a decade. They'll be able to look at scans and give more reliable results faster at a lot lower cost. The change is also social change. 
We were in a father knows best America back when, when three quarters of our population were white Americans who hadn't gone to college, less than 5% foreign born, less than 10% of our economy was traded, and more than three quarters were in manufacturing. Today, we're a far more diverse economy and a far more diverse society. I think that's a great strength for Americans, but it's pretty rapid change in 50 years to see these sort of changes, tripling the amount of foreign born uh, for whites who had not gone to college. And, and we heard a lot in Janesville, uh, fewer than half almost. Uh, we're about to be at a point where half as many in the US population, a lot less manufacturing as employment, a lot more trade. So how do families feel about this pace of change? Well, they feel they can't keep up. Pew asked uh, a year ago, how does your family deal with the pace of change? 49% economically said, we're falling behind. 40% said, no, you know, we're keeping even with the cost of living. And only 9% of families felt that they're going up faster. And the reason for that is because fewer families are going up faster. It's not just perception, there's also reality. When you look at income growth, what you find is the top 5% have seen the lion's share of income growth. That's the dashed line. The dark blue line that shows you the top one-fifth, the top 20%. And what we know, what we've seen, is if you have more education and more experience, you've got extraordinary possibilities and opportunities that no one ever had before. There's a terrific author, Scott Galloway. He recently wrote a book called The Four, about Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, and their rise and what they mean in society. And the most poignant line for me in that book was when he observed there's never been a time in human history when it's been better to be extraordinary or worse to be ordinary. That's why Operation Hope's work is so important. So in this world where technology and society are changing rapidly and people can't keep up, to whom do they turn to make sense of it all? Well, in 1972, we knew the answer because the most trusted person in America was not a political leader, was not a, real, a religious leader, it wasn't a military leader. It was a journalist. It was the guy who read the news on the TV at night. Families tuned into Walter Cronkite and the other two major networks. Why? Because he informed. They told you, what's, what should I think about the space race or Vietnam or Watergate? And families and voters with open minds learned and formed opinions. When you watch the news on TV, on cable, what do you get now? Well, if you're a right-wing lunatic, you're told that America was great, then Barack Obama was president, and now we're great again. And if you're a left-wing uh, winger, you're told everything was utopia until the inaugural address, at which point we have fallen off the face of the earth and we're a third world republic. Neither is a fair estimate of what's going on, but in the search for victory in a highly competitive cable market, they don't inform, they affirm. And even of greater concern, most of us get our news from our friends on Facebook, and most of our friends already agree with us ideologically. It exacerbates confirmation bias. And then, by the way, the algorithms, as we're learning now, the algorithms are built to give you more of what you like. So if Melman likes cat videos, Melman gets more cat videos. If you think Breitbart is giving you accurate news, Facebook and the others are programmed to give you twice as much Breitbart. Guess what you think is happening in the world? Not what's happening in the world. As a result, also, we've lost trust in the institution of the media. When you take a look, at Americans who have a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the media. Uh, the blue line are Democrats who had been down to 51% in Barack Obama's last year. Republicans sank already to 14%. Donald Trump's fighting the media is strategic because Republican voters don't trust the media anyway. Independents are only a third, and Democrats didn't trust the media, although now that the media and Donald Trump are at war, it's uh, jumped all the way to 72%. But it's not just the institution of the media. Look at other institutions. Who do we trust? The medical establishment? Well, they told us opioids weren't addicted. Hollywood, police, we have lost faith in our institutions. And the data backed that up when Gallup took a look. In 1977, a majority of Americans had faith in basic institutions like bank, church, public schools. Today, roughly less than a third, a little fewer more in church, have confidence in our institutions. Now, I could stand up here and tell you the problem is our institutions that are failing, the media, technology. I'm from Washington, and I'd like to think I'm here to help. But we in Washington have been known, uh, politicians, to overpromise and underdeliver. So if you like your health plan, you can keep it, is not the way the Affordable Care Act was designed. And the creators of the Affordable Care Act knew that people would lose their doctors from time to time, but you couldn't sell it if you didn't explain that. I'll be bipartisan. Major combat operations had not ended in Iraq 
when uh, former president made this comment, we lost extraordinary blood and treasure in the decade plus in Iraq since then. I'm not sure if you know how this sentence ends. Uh, that was not a true statement by any definition of the words that were involved, at least that I've ever learned. And you know, when, when I thought a terrific president, George H.W. Bush 41 served, he had said in the 88 convention that if Democrats want to raise taxes, I'm going to tell them, read my lips, no new taxes. Terrible Clint Eastwood imitation. Uh, Democrats controlled Congress. They came to the president and they said, you know, look, we control Congress. Uh, we want to raise taxes so the deficit doesn't get out of control. And he said, well, you know what? The founders designed a system built for compromise. I'm going to compromise. Yet the modern right wing of the right wing was born with Gingrich and others who said, no, no, Mr. President, you should have vetoed that bill and you should have shut government down until you got what you wanted. It doesn't work that way. But we voters see they're kicking the can. So when you take a look at how politicians solve our problems, in 1968, federal spending was one third interest, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, and two thirds defense, education, research, infrastructure, investments in the future. Fast forward to 1988, it had flipped. A little more than half were on these interest and mandatory accounts, and less than half was in investments in the future. Today, 70% of federal spending, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, important programs for sure, but programs designed for, designed for a very different demographic profile and that are crowding out investments in education and infrastructure in the future and go forward, 2038, only 20% 20 of our federal budget. We voters see this. Now, I'd love to absolve us, the voters, and say it's institutions and government's fault, but we have changed. If you're an old movie fan, basically any movie with Sidney Poitier ever is a great movie. Throw in Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn, and, and you have an instant classic that will cause your children to leave the room if you have teenagers like I did. But the great, uh, one of the great movies of all time, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, the premise was a white woman brings an African-American boyfriend home to uh, suburban America. And it was great in exposing the, the uh, kind of under-the-surface racism. This isn't the extraordinary uh, heroism of the Pettus Bridge, but this is the everyday pernicious racism in suburbia. Uh, that undermines so much success and so much growth. Here's a different question. Would you be displeased if your child married, not outside your religion or your background, outside your political party? When they asked the question in 1960, 5% of Republicans, 4% of Democrats said yes, they would. They asked the question again in 2010, the summer of the Tea Party. 49% of Republicans and one third of Democrats say, I'd be pissed off if my son or daughter brought home a Democrat, a Republican. That's crazy. And what do partisan voters get? They get partisan representatives. So taking a look at the ideological overlap in the House of Representatives, where there are 435 elected members. When Ronald Reagan was president in 1982, 344 out of the 435 were in the ideological center. You had blue dog Democrats in the South, you had Northeastern Rockefeller Republicans, they called them in the Northeast, and you had a pretty big middle to work with. When Bill Clinton was president, 1994, 252 out of 435 were in the ideological center. When I served in the George W. Bush administration, we only had 137 out of 435, and we felt really sorry for ourselves, because how are we going to build consensus on all these policies when members don't see eye to eye? Let's cut President Obama a break. In 2012, there were only 13 out of 400 and 35 members in the ideological center, and you thought it couldn't possibly get any worse than that. 2013 rolls around, it's down to four. Two Democrats, two Republicans. I'm not gonna tell you who they are, they're in the witness protection program. <laughs> but the middle disappeared. So Melman, you started this by saying you're an optimist. How are you possibly an optimist based upon that? Well, the disruption's gonna continue, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm optimistic. First, for those who like President Trump, here's some good news for you. We're not quite 30% through his first term. There's more than 1,000 days remaining. For those who are not fans of our president, the bar is right down the hallway. Uh, disruptors are in the driver's seat. And the macro trends lean towards disruption. So for example, uh, we heard this morning, technology, data is the new oil. When you look at the biggest, most valuable global companies by market capitalization, in 2003, there was one in information technology. In 2008, heavy in the oil and gas. 2018, and, and I didn't update this uh, for the last two weeks, Facebook may not be on the list, I don't know, uh, but it's all information technology. Data 
is driving company success, and it's not just companies like this. It's great American brands like Procter & Gamble and Walmart and Boeing, and every business has to understand how do we take advantage of data. Number two, power. America is the new Saudi Arabia. The fracking revolution is scrambling geopolitics. And so what you're seeing is, in just a decade, America has gone to become the largest producer of oil, according to BP, uh, around the world. That's causing Russia to act out because they're losing some leverage. It's causing Saudi Arabia to look to new alliances. It's, uh, it's radically changing things. It's disruptive. And third, uh, China has risen extraordinarily. When you take a look at China's share of the global domestic product, the, the, its share of the global total, what you find uh, by purchasing power parity, now, now to be crystal clear, the US GDP is higher than China's, but purchasing power parity tells you how many fighter planes you can buy or how many uh, new nuclear power plants you can build. It's how much buying power you have, and China is number one in the world now. So we have extraordinary disruptors going forward, yet what we're seeing is people stepping up, people looking to lead. It's no longer just Washington, solve it, fix it, tell us what to do. States, governors, legislatures, attorneys general, they're challenging the feds, they're challenging around the world, whether it's sanctuary cities or uh, efforts to wade into telecommunications, which if our friend John Donovan were here would point out is precluded by the Interstate Commerce Clause, but 37 states are trying to weigh in on that neutrality. Around the world, other nations, the United States Federal Trade Commission historically didn't want to challenge Google for market behavior, yet Vestager in the EU did. China's trying to lead in global investment with their One Belt, One Road initiative. There was a time when investing in space, space travel, space commerce, it was NASA. That's all who did it. Tell Elon Musk, tell Viasat, tell Globalstar. There are companies now around the world uh, that are leading in global, leading in space investment. You see the same with some of the world's, some of the nation's leading uh, innovators talking about we're going to solve healthcare. There are other folks who think that currency can and should be taken out of uh, leadership by, by countries. And then, of course, NGOs. And organizations such as Operation Hope have been around for a while, but NGOs have more money, are exerting more power, and are driving more change than they ever have. And we're seeing companies stepping up to the plate and leading because there are new opportunities to do so. But at the end of the day, I feel like the great message of Operation Hope is it's not, don't look to the federal government to lead, don't look to the state government to lead, don't look even to NGOs. It's about individuals and individual empowerment. We're in, a, in an era now where everyone is a witness and can bear witness. And in that uh, hope and fury video, that, the, uh, that horrific shooting that the, the woman in uh, real time Facebook messengered out was extraordinary. Everybody's a witness. That's incredible power in all of our hands. Likewise, everybody's a publisher. Facebook's got its problems, but it connects two billion people. So if the police in Chicago airport drag a doctor off a flight and punch him, guess what? Two billion people can see that. Everyone's a witness, everyone's a publisher, and everybody's an activist now. It's for those who are upset, and I'm a, I'm a parent, who are upset by social media and your, your kid being obsessed with their phone, that's a problem. At the same time, remember the ice bucket challenge? They didn't spend a lot of money on that. That was just a brilliant idea that went viral. You've seen the same thing with the lead Uber. You're seeing it with the Parkland kids. The Me Too movement. Uh, needed both a political moment, which has arrived, and it needed a technological moment, which has arrived. So here's my conclusion. Think about an America where there's concerns about income inequality because of recent financial collapse, concerns about immigration being historic highs of our population, and for some, the perception that that's creating new competition at home that they didn't want. Accelerating innovation makes it harder in some ways to be a parent, harder to have one job you're going to keep, uh, unless you're at AT&T, where their retraining is extraordinary. Politics are dominated by the top 1% who are investing themselves. And election after election, red states and blue states, gridlock in Congress, elections being decided not by the popular vote, but by the Electoral College. What you're looking at there is the electoral map, college map from the 1888 election. Go back and read your Doris Kearns Goodwin. And what you'll find is the Gilded Age were these exact politics, the politics of today. Well, what happened? Why am I an optimist? Because change came. We had economic reforms like trust busting, antitrust laws, food safety laws, worker safety laws, child labor laws. We had political reforms. 
no corporate contributions. Women get the right to vote extraordinarily after almost two decades in our country's history. Direct election of senators and not kind of the back room uh, deals. You had social reforms. The, 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 the uh, opi opioids of their day was alcohol, and they did a constitutional amendment to try to deal with that drug. But you also had the high school movement. You had this recognition that we can't have people succeed in that modern world of 100 plus years ago unless they had better education. I think change is coming again. We need reforms. We need economic reforms to expand the winner circle. We can't just have the top 5% who have the best degrees succeed. And Operation Hope proves, thank you, proves uh, that if you give people the skills and the tools to be entrepreneurs, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. But unless and until we expand the winner circle, expect more change elections, expect more populist backlash, expect uh, more difficult times in our country. We've got to restore public trust in institutions. It starts with the media, but it goes far beyond that. And we need a system again where there's principled compromise. Right now, political power and political activity are driven by the extremes, and the middle is mellow. And one of the greatest lessons of the civil rights movement was how the brilliance of Dr. King and the leaders got the middle to become engaged and aware and militant. And it's when we have a militant middle again that we can require and demand compromise. I appreciate your being here. If you love slides as much as I do, send me an email, I'll send you mine. Thank you.